So first of all, welcome to the OSCON Cloud Summit as sponsored by Rackspace. Now, as with all cloud conferences, we're going to start with the dreaded question. You know it's coming. And that question is, what is cloud computing? The best definition of cloud computing out there is NIST definition. This is it, the uh, National Institute of Science and Technology's definition. If you can't read it, don't worry. It, the only useful thing it says is that cloud computing is still an evolving paradigm. That's consultant speak, for we don't know what cloud is yet. But don't worry, Steve Ballmer, Microsoft CEO, said that the thing to do is to capture what are the dimensions of the thing that literally I will tell you we're betting our company on, and I think pretty much everybody in the technology industry is betting their companies on too. Translation, we don't know what cloud is yet. Bet your company on it, everybody else is. The good news is that cloud does open up exciting new prospects for the employment of computers in ways and on a scale that would have seemed pure fantasy just five years ago. The bad news is this was written in 1966 in the challenge of the computer utility, where Douglas Parkhill predicted that in the future, computer resources would be provided just like electricity through large providers. These large utilities would have certain characteristics. They would be online, elastic. They would be charged on a utility basis. They would cover multiple deployment models, private, public, community, and government utilities. And they would deal with everything from hardware to applications. 44 years later, this is what NIST says the cloud is. So what's changed? Is cloud just really a bunch of consultants trying to bamboozle us into believing that something old is in fact something new? Is there any real substance to the cloud? Now, being a scientist, I, I thought I'd investigate this. So I looked at the change of business activities. I plotted a graph of ubiquity, how commonplace a business activity is, against the certainty of that activity, how well-defined and understood it was. I added some real data and hypothesize that an S-curve relationship exists between the, between the uh, ubiquity and the certainty of an activity. It shows a pathway for how a rare and poorly understood innovation over time becomes a common and well-defined commodity. And you can see this in IT with something like CRM, Customer Relationship Management Systems. So we've gone from the innovation of CRM in the early 80s to the introduction of custom-built systems called database marketing, to the first products of the early 90s, and eventually the utility-like services of Salesforce today. CRM has undergone this transformation, this evolution from innovation, custom-built product, commodity, and utility services. And you can see this transformation in other aspects of uh, computer resources. So for example, if you look at the Infrastructure, you've got the innovation of the Z3 in 1941, the introdu introduction of custom-built systems like Leo in 1949. You've got the first products like the IBM 650, the constant movement of infrastructure towards more commodity hardware, and eventually the utility-like services of Amazon today. And it's not just IT. Many different types of activities, many different types of businesses go through this transformation. Take electricity provision, from the innovation of Wollaston, to the introduction of the first products like the Hippolyte Pixie, to the introduction of the first utility grids, and then eventually the formation of the national grid. All business activities are somewhere on that curve, and all of them are evolving along it. They are constantly moving along this curve and becoming commoditized. So why does commoditization occur? Well, ask any businessman and they will tell you the business is little more than warfare. It's a catfight. And as soon as one company gains some form of technological advantage, some new big gun, like an e-commerce site, then all its competitors will follow suit. This creates a constant demand for anything which is useful. But there's also a competition to supply this new stuff. And anytime anybody introduces some new thing, 
say, kit and body armor, someone will come up with a better version. So there's a constant drive for improvement. And it's these two forces which drive that process of commoditization. So what is cloud then? Well, simply, it's a huge group of activities which were once innovations, but more recently have been provided as products with feature differentiation, have become so ubiquitous and so widespread, they've moved up that curve and become suitable for utility service provision. And that's it. Cloud simply represents an evolution of a bunch of activities across the computing stack from software platform and infrastructure, from an as a product to an as a service world. And it's no different to what's happened in the electricity industry, which is why we often use the analogy and why Douglas Parkhill's predictions of 1966 were so correct. So why now? Why is cloud happening today? Why didn't it occur back in 1966? Well, you needed a number of factors before cloud could occur. One was the concept, but we've had that for 40 years. Two, you needed the suitability of activities for the volume operations needed to support these utility providers. And that's happened in the last decade. You needed the technology to achieve this, but we've had that for some time. And you needed a change in business attitude, a willingness to adopt these new models. And this is where we're going to start the conference off. So we're going to start OSCON Cloud Computing Summit with Mark Masterson, who's CSE's enterprise architect and self-appointed troublemaker, asking the question, is the enterprise ready for the cloud? Of course, the shift from a product to a service world isn't without risks, which brings us on to our second topic of the day, which is Subrakumar Swami from eBay, who is going to cover security identity, or do we need to go back to the drawing board? Now, the commoditization of any activity offers a promise of increased agility through use of standardized components. We've seen this in many industries. Cloud computing is no different. And if you look, this is the time it took one particular company to put in place a server pre-cloud and a 64-node cluster pre-cloud, 72,000 minutes for one server. This is the time it now takes them after they've in implemented both a private and a public cloud solution. 72,000 minutes to seven minutes, 64-node cluster, 130,000 minutes to 15 minutes. I mean, this is a before and after graph, which sort of beggars belief. So. Cloud promises so much power, so much agility. But as we all know, with much power comes much mess. The ability to create and destroy such huge infrastructures at will across multiple providers creates its own problems. We're going to see increasingly the question of, where did I leave that 128-node Hadoop cluster? Examining this subject, we have John Willis from Opscode, who's going to look at cloudy operations. But as well as increased agility, cloud also offers the promise of massive efficiency, economies of scale. But don't confuse this with saving money, because the increased efficiency and increased agility are more likely to result in increased consumption. This effect is not new. We've known this from 1865, Jevons paradox. Technology progress that increases the efficiency with which a resource is used tends to increase the rate of consumption of that resource. So back then, they thought that they made steam engines more efficient. They thought, wow, we'll use less coal. Of course not. They just found new uses for steam engines. Cloud is unlikely to save you money. You'll just end up doing more stuff. Exploring this and the other myths, schemes, and dirty little secrets of the cloud we have Pat Copain, CTO of Cohesive FT. Of course, not everybody is happy about cloud. Uh, cloud is highly disruptive for people who are product vendors. Some vendors are hooked over the big fixes they get from selling you know, licenses and, and the constant upgrade cycle. As Doug Neal once noted, there are only two groups of people who call their customers users. The first 
is drug dealers. The other is software vendors. Exploring whether we can give up these nasty habits, we have Stephen O'Grady from Red Monk, who will be talking about curing addiction is easier. After this, we'll have a break and a nice cup of tea. When we return, we're going to concentrate more about the future, where the industry is going. And I'm delighted to say we have two leading lights of the industry, uh, with JP Rangaswamy, who's the uh, Managing Director of Strategy and Innovation at BT, and Dion Hinchcliffe, who will be covering the connections between cloud and enterprise 2.0. After that, more tea. When we return, we're going to look at some of the big debates or squabbles that you often see cloud consultants getting into over cloud. You've heard them before. Private cloud isn't cloud. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, no, it isn't. Well, we thought we'd add a bit more decorum to this. So we've decided to have a few presidential-style debates. Queensbury rules apply. And the debates will be judged by a balanced and somber jury, including Mark, Subra, Stephen, and Pat. And the first debate that we're going to look at is what we need are standards in the cloud. And for this heavyweight debate, we have George Reese, CTO of OnStratus, and also James Duncan, who's the VP of Joint. This debate will then be followed by our open APIs enough to prevent locking, where we'll have Sam Johnson from Google and the legend of cloud that is Benjamin Black. By the end of this, I hope we should have moved from a sorry state of confusion over cloud to one of enlightenment just in time for another cup of tea. When we return, we will ask the big questions, like what is the relationship between cloud and open source? Helping us on our journey, we have James Urquhart from Cisco, who will look at the journey of cloud so far. We have Martin Mikos, who will look at open source and cloud, a natural fit or mortal enemies. We have Rick Clark from OpenStack, who will look at open source and competitive markets. And finally, but not least, we have Neil Levine, who's the SVP of Canonical, who will look at the future of open source. Then all four of them will come together, and we will have that debate of the relationship between cloud and open source. The next big question is, where is cloud going? Is it a cloudy future, or can we see a path? To help us in this journey, we have Kate Craig Wood, who's the UK government G Cloud architect and founder of Memset. And we also have Tim O'Reilly, who will discuss how things have changed since he coined the term Infoware and the Internet Operating System all those years ago. We will then have a panel with both uh, Tim and Kate, and JP and Dion will also join us. And that roughly is the schedule for OSCON Cloud Summit. Now, I'll be co-chairing this summit with John Willis. John, I'm welcoming you to the stage. Uh, my name, for those of you who don't know me, is Simon Wardley. I am a researcher at LEF, the leading edge forum. Welcome to the stage, hey, John. Simon, thank you. Thank How you. How you doing? Good. Good. Did you Good. enjoy the uh, football? Football. That doesn't start till like August. The World Cup. Oh, that World Cup. The stuff that brought Twitter down. That crazy stuff. So, yeah, he, uh, me and Simon. I work for Simon, and like we always get these names mixed up. He continues to call soccer football. So, knock it off. Knock it off. <laughs> well, all I'm going to say is, have you ever seen a cloud in San Francisco? I certainly haven't. Yeah. I mean, I'm from England. We have, uh, we have more clouds than you can possibly imagine. We only have three seasons, uh, the, the rainy season, the more rainy season, and where the hell went summer season. So um, should we work on our first speaker to the yeah, stage? No, and again, I want to thank you for being involved in this. This is going to be a great day. It's like we've got awesome speakers. So.